<laughs> okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. And, and I'd like to thank uh, both and my former colleague for inviting me up to talk about an issue that I do spend a lot of time thinking about. And that is, of course, the strategic direction that is happening in the Arctic. One can't help but see what has been happening in regards to the Ukraine as a very clear element of a gestalt of how you see the Arctic. And I'll be able to provide you with a little bit of a discussion in the context that we are seeing within the Canadian context, both in terms of policymakers and academics, exactly how to understand what the Russians are doing in, in Ukraine and what that then means for the Arctic. However, what I would argue and the main takeaway that I hope you can take is that what the situation in Ukraine actually demonstrates is that it illustrates an ongoing transformation that is going on the geopolitical reality of Russia. That in fact that what, and to a certain degree following uh, what the uh, ambassador was saying, we're seeing certain directions, certain changes, definitely from the third term of the Putin administration that are suggesting that this, of course, is just the beginning of a new set of policies. So, when we start talking about the Arctic, just to set the stage, when we talk about the Arctic, the major point that we all have to remember is that the Arctic is going through a period of transformation, the likes of which we haven't seen before. We, as a species, have never seen the Arctic ice-free. And probably this summer, or within about five summers, we're going to see an ice-free Arctic. It has occurred in the past, but we had not yet evolved from basically being relatively small primates at that point in time. Now, just to give you a bit of a, a sense of when we're talking about. There's a huge transformation going in terms of cultural issues. If you want to talk about perhaps what we are seeing as the last generation of true hunters and gatherers within the Arctic, the ability of the Inuit to pursue their traditional lifespan, not just culture change, it's, it's a whole host of other factors, but we're probably at the last generation. The current generation is not, because of globalization, education, and a whole host of other factors, are not having the same type of life skills of what we've seen. So basically, we're the last generation to see ice cover, permanent ice cover. We're the last generation to be able to talk about the Inuit having a traditional way of life. There will be a few that remain. And economically, yes, oil and gas is pulled out for the time being, but it'll be back. And for anyone of the last generation who's gotten married, in all likelihood, you're probably wearing a diamond that came from the Northwest Territories. We, once again, we tend to forget about the fact that there has been transformations. Trying to understand any one of these is complicated enough, but then when you add in the geopolitical transformations that are occurring literally before our eyes, then you can have an appreciation for the type of changes. So the question that I pose to you today is, what does this change of the changing nature of the Arctic environment mean given the environment of what has happened vis-a-vis -vis Russia, and specifically what it tells us in the context of what has happened with Ukraine. There are two narratives. You can find it in the literature, and you can find it in the governance section. On the one side, we have a narrative that the Arctic is developing as a unique environment. It is peace, rule-based, cooperative. And the focus is on all the Arctic states following this. And so the subtext here is understood that the Russians are playing by the rules, the Russians are cooperative, they are in fact proceeding in a way that most people, at least from a liberal democratic perspective, would like to see the international system go. The second narrative, and I would argue of course that this is the more sort of minor narrative, but it's one that I will be quite honest that I tend to be much more sympathetic to, is that there is a facade of cooperation. Yes, we've had 10 years of cooperation, but we have cooperated about how to cooperate. We haven't actually gotten into a situation where we have to start talking about how we are actually going to do things. So we have set up some amazing institutions. The Arctic Council has done very well. We have had some amazing photo opportunities and talking, and we've had some situations where we've been able to cre create some treaties that may, in fact, down the line, be important, such as search and rescue. 
but that ultimately this facade of cooperation masks the fact there are growing geopolitical differences. The Ukrainian situation, of course, just being one illustrative nature of it. Now, what's the impact of the crisis in Ukraine? Well, I'll count one. If you follow the discussion that the Arctic is a fundamentally cooperative region, if you accept the argumentation of what the new Secretary or Foreign Minister says, Dion, that in fact that the Arctic is a unique area. If you, if you follow the literature written forward from the right likes of someone like a Michael Byers or Whitney Lockenborough or Franklin Griffiths, you will say that ultimately the Ukraine crisis is a short-term aberration that the Russians had their own specific reasons for what they did vis-a-vis -vis the Crimea and the Eastern Arctic, and that ultimately, Arctic cooperation is so fundamentally strong, we will come back to it. In other words, the argumentation that many of my colleagues made is that Ukraine will soon be behind us, and we will proceed with the type of cooperation that we've always had in the, uh, in, in the Arctic since 1989. And that ultimately, the reason why, it's in the long-term interest for everyone to proceed in this manner. But what about the second outcome? What about the narrative that it is not, that it is a facade? Well, then, of course, the situation turns very differently. Then we can be arguing that the Ukrainian action is a part of an ongoing set of aggressive policies of an increasingly aggressive Russian administration. That Ukraine is not, because the first narrative tends to say Ukraine is the first time they've done this, and so therefore don't, it, it will go away, it will pass. The second narrative, of course, says no, you have to go back to Georgia. You have to go back to 2008, when, of course, the Russian administration began to use military force to attempt to respond to a country, of course, that was trying to talk about joining NATO. And that ultimately the Arctic, regardless of what we may wish it to be, is increasingly becoming part of the international system for good and for bad, and that ultimately what will happen from the greater geopolitical environment absolutely spills into it. So you can see we have two very different understandings of how we will be proceeding. So what has happened so far? since the sanctions, since the Russian uh, activity in Ukraine. Well, first and foremost, from a Canadian perspective, we have canceled limited diplomatic actions. We were the chair of the Arctic Council. We actually stopped certain of Canadian officials from going to meetings in Moscow. Certain Moscow officials did not come to some of our meetings, so we saw some of that. The other factor, of course, that plays into the Arctic is what we are seeing occurring in Sweden and Finland. In these two countries, first of all, we are seeing increased military activity on the part of the Russians being publicly discussed. There's a bit of an issue in the literature as to whether or not the Russians had been doing this prior to their intervention in Ukraine. In other words, whether or not some of the submarine interventions, some of the aerial overflights were occurring beforehand, and now the Swedes and Finns are a little bit more willing to openly discuss it or whether or not the Russians picked up the tempo. That's a little bit uncertain in terms of the literature. But the bottom line is, is what we see clearly since the Russian intervention in Ukraine is the Finns and, and the Swedes openly discussing the fact that A, they cannot defend themselves, B, that there is growing Russian aggressive actions against them. And so the question that flows into this from the purposes of NATO is what happens in terms of their ongoing reluctance to join NATO. And so we are seeing discussions in certain corners in both Sweden and Finland about what and whether or not they should join NATO. Now what that means, of course, for the Arctic is that should these two countries join the NATO alliance, it means in terms of other cooperative ventures within the Arctic, such as the Arctic Council, we will now have an Arctic Council that has seven NATO members and one Russian. And the question is, would the Russians then continue with the type of cooperative behavior that they have had in the Arctic Council if in fact that they were feeling that they were being encircled, regardless of whether or not they have in fact become more aggressive or not? We also see cooling of relations with other Russians and Arctic states. Now, having said that, you also have to be aware that under the new Trudeau administration, there are efforts to improve the Arctic relationships. 
We have seen, once again, Foreign Minister Dion talking openly that the Russian relationship within the Arctic has to be improved upon, and we have started to embark upon second track diplomacy. We've started sending certain academics over to Russia to, once again, talk about cooperation, stuff that, of course, had stopped completely during the Harvard administration. Now, one of the issues that's coming up is, of course, that for the first time, Canada will have a border with Russia. And this is all part of the United Nations Convention on the extension of the continental shelf. From a physical perspective, it's fairly clear that we, in fact, following the Lazarus Moth Ridge, that basically joins North America and Greenland to the Russian mainland, that ultimately both Russia, Denmark, and Canada will be able to claim an extended continental shelf. Up to this point, everyone has been playing by the rule book. Everyone has been following what is necessary. Where it is going to get very interesting in this regard is two years ago, when the Department of Foreign Affairs and those individuals that were engaged upon the mapping presented before Cabinet what they had done in the context of how far they had mapped, Cabinet, this was in December of 2014, Cabinet asked them, why have you not gone past the North Pole? Now, once again, we don't know for certain, but the Globe and Mail reports that, in fact, that they had no answer for that, though there seems to have been a gentleman's agreement amongst the, the Russian, Danish, and, and Canadian scientists to stop at the North Pole to avoid any form of overlap. The problem with that is it gives the Russians about 200 extra nautical miles. Now, what Harper then made the individuals to do is go and said, go and map further on the Russian side. From discussions I've had with some of the officials and Coast Guard uh, officials that were involved, it looks as if that may support the Canadian position. But what it means is ultimately we will have an overlapping submission with the Russians. Now, what does that mean in the context of the ongoing relationships? We don't know because neither side has submitted formally yet. So we're still waiting to see the Canadian submission. So the question of how well our relationship goes will undoubtedly impact on our borders. Now, a factor that does not come into the literature, and one that I think is going to be forgotten at our peril, is the fact that we are seeing a development of a new strategic relationship in the Arctic. There is this narrative that is cooperative, that things are going well. But if we actually stop and ask the question, what are the core strategic interests of Russia, the United States, and increasingly China, and how then does this play over in terms of all these other relationships, the ongoing cooperations we've seen, but also in terms of the issue of when we see Russia doing something such as the Ukrainian intervention. In Russia, they've made this clear. This is their policy since around 205. The number one is nuclear stability. That's their nuclear deterrence, maintenance of that. And they have invested huge amounts of money in that regards. The second major objective, and this is, goes back to the Yeltsin administration, limiting NATO. The third is stopping the American ballistic missile system. And we'll see in a moment how this all spills into the Arctic and how something such as the Ukraine then complicates it. For the Americans, in the Arctic, it's protecting, or it, for, for the Americans, their second priority behind their nuclear deterrence is protecting the homeland. And it means building up the ABM. Once again, this is all in their documentation and it's in their expenditures. Now we know that since 2007, the Russians have resumed long range bombers. Yes, that plane is older than me, but the missiles that it carries within are as modern as you have in the Russian arsenal. And the Norwegians have strong suspicions that when the Russian bear goes on patrol, it often is carrying nuclear-tipped missiles. In other words, active nuclear weapons. When they're flying up to the Arctic airspace of Canada, the United States, Norway, and England. Now, in terms of how many intercepts we've had, you can see in terms of the 1980s, when it really got bad, we had a lot of intercepts. This chart only goes to 211. The, the Air Force won't share the stats after that because, of course, the ir irony here is it really gets bad after that. Unofficially, the Russian intercepts into our airspace in 2016 is roughly akin to the worst of the Cold War. 
Not only are the numbers there, but the complexities are there. The Russians are now sending fighter escort for some of these overflights. And you have to ask the question, why would you have to do that in terms of the effort? Now, not to leave the Americans out, the Americans have also resumed their submarine patrols in the region. Or they probably have always had them, but they're letting the public know. How do they do this? They have a scientific use of their attack subs. Do they really need to use their attack subs for science? Eh, probably not, but it's a very nice way of getting a photo op, and it's a very nice way in which they can publicize the fact that their submarines are in fact operating again. So you see every two years they do an ISEX. They've done patrols with the Brits, and the Brits are about to begin patrols again. So in other words, once again, anyone who thought the Cold War was over, someone forgot to tell the Americans. Now, when we start looking at how this spills over in the Arctic and what it means in terms of when we see this type of behavior of the Russians, nuclear stability for the Russians is predicated on their northern fleet. They are moving away from their ICBMs, their la land-based missiles, because of the accuracy of anti-missile technology. They, everybody knows if you have an ICBM, this is why the North Koreans are launching submarine-based uh, uh, missiles, because that's how you protect it. You protect your modern nuclear deterrents by going and placing them in submarines. If you look at the investment of the Russian military since 2005, you'll see that they've promised a lot, and they haven't delivered. But where they have delivered is their submarine force, and it's in the northern base. So what does this tell us? This tells us clearly that regardless of our relationships with Russia, the Arctic represents the core strategic interest of Russia. And so anything that happens there has to be predicated on this. They've been telling us they do not want NATO expanded. Now once again, the Georgian intervention had other reasons, but once again it's not surprising that it was in 208 when the Georgians start talking about membership into NATO, and that we see President Bush talking about it, that the Russians then up the ante. With Ukraine, similar set of circumstances. Ukraine starts talking EEC and starts talking EU and starts talking NATO. We see military intervention. And so the question is, what happens to Finland and Sweden? Now, seeing the Russian behavior, what happens in terms if they do decide to join? And ultimately, to stop the USABM. Now, why does the USABM factor into the Arctic? Well, the Americans, because the ABM threat to them, they perceive is from North Korea, they have placed the bulk of their mid-range interceptors in Alaska. It's about 70 miles away from the Yukon border in a place called Fort Greeley. Every time that the Koreans do something silly, the Americans, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter if it's Republican or Democrat, increase the capabilities and numbers of the interceptors. And so therefore, we're starting to see the Russians and the Chinese look to Fort Greeley and say, okay, these bases are against us. They're not against the North Koreans. You're adding too many missiles. Now, the Americans, of course, say no, it's about North Korea, full stop. But technology is fungible. So we have a dynamic developing in terms of missile technology, in terms of both launch and ABM, that is going to make the Arctic very problematic. So where does this take us? Well, this takes us into a set of environments that the Arctic illustrates, despite the narrative, despite the political discussions that this is a region of cooperation. The facts point to the very opposite. The facts point to the reality that the Arctic is going to become the major strategic, strategic point of tension between the Russians and the Americans. And if you want to make it more complicated, the Chinese have just recently started sending naval vessels into the Arctic. This September, for the first time, we saw a five-ship flotilla fly, uh, sailing through Aleutian waters. Now, they all stayed within international waters. This is the first time they're there. We also, at the same time, saw Chinese naval vessels visiting free Finland, Sweden, and Denmark. They left Norway off because they're still pissed off at the Norwegians for giving a, a Nobel Peace Prize to one of the dissidents. But there's suspicions, it's not confirmed, but there's suspicions that the latest class of the Chinese attack subs are being given under ICE capabilities. And so what does this all tell us? This all tells us regardless of what happened in Ukraine, what happened in Georgia, 
But the core strategic differences between the United States, Russia, and China are about to get very complicated. And we, of course, as an ally of the Americans, will automatically be involved. In other words, we can say, okay, should we be worried about whether or not we continue sanctions against the, the Russians because of what happened in Ukraine or not? We can talk about uh, Foreign Minister Dion talking about the fact that, well, maybe we, we need to make up and be, be better friends with Russia. But there is a logic that is developing here. As the Russians build up to protect their geopolitics in this region, what is going to happen is it's going to create two reactions. We are going to see Canada and the United States upping their ability in NORAD, and the discussions have begun. You will see probably in about a year's time, and it'll probably be part of the defense review, and we're seeing the current defense minister talk about it. Maybe we do have to start talking about officially joining the American ABM capabilities. We're the only ally of the U.S. that has said no to this point. All the Europeans and all the Asian allies have already said yes, they're on. NATO says yes. And so there's a real irony that we're the only ones out, even though that we're the most direct in the flight plan. From a NATO perspective, what is going to be happening is Finland and Sweden will be seeking membership. When they do, we're going to be faced with two possibilities. We say no, but that will be sending the signal that we are afraid of Russian behavior. If we say yes, it is probably going to destroy any hope that we're going to have of a continued cooperative Arctic regime that is developed under the auspices of the Arctic Council. So ultimately, you follow the logic of what's happening here. Add in factors such as the crisis in Ukraine, and you can start to appreciate that this is not an aberration, but is in fact the beginning of a new set of geopolitical relationships that we can understand by having a closer examination of what's happening in the Arctic. Thank you very much.